The very first Puyo Puyo game was released in 1991 for the MSX2 and Famicom Disk System in Japan. There wasn't really that much to it, just a falling block puzzle game where you make them disappear by matching four of the same color. It went relatively unnoticed at the time, but a year later, everything changed when Compile decided to give their puzzle game an arcade release. While the original versions focused on solo play with a multiplayer mode included, this arcade release changed things up solely focusing on competitive play. Compile took inspiration from Street Fighter 2 and made the solo mode a series of one-on-one -on -one battles against AI opponents with increasing difficulty. Instead of being purely about survival like other games in its genre, like Tetris or Dr. Mario, Puyo Puyo in the arcades is about offense. Notice how the Puyos are actually affected by gravity? Well, the name of the game here is getting chain reactions, and the size of your chain determines the amount of garbage pieces that fall on the opponent's field. It's not the end of the world, as these can be cleared by clearing regular Poyos right next to them. However, if you can't keep your field clean and get enough chain reactions to keep your opponent at bay, your screen will fill up in no time, and once it reaches the top, you'll lose. Compile struck gold with this gameplay formula, as it's insanely addicting. Despite it being a multiplayer-focused game, with the way the solo mode is structured, it's actually fun to play by yourself, and it has great replay value. It's not just the gameplay that made Poyo Poyo catch on. Another factor is the fun cast of characters you run into during the solo mode. You take control of Aurel and you go on an adventure going through a wide variety of opponents until you reach your destination and face the final boss, Satan. These characters actually predate Puyo Puyo and originated from a series of dungeon crawler RPGs on the MSX2 known as Mato Monogatari, also developed by Compile. Puyo Puyo's entire cast consists of enemies and characters from this series as opponents. These are some weird little fellas. You got your typical humanoid characters, but the second opponent in the run is a fucking fish with human limbs. I'm an A-class fisherman myself, and I've never seen one of those before. Aw, this guy looks a lot more normal and cute looking than Fishman. I wonder what he had- WHAT THE FUCK IS THAT?! I feel like it's worth pointing out that Mato Motogatari had a very different style compared to Puyo Puyo. So while some characters transitioned with no changes whatsoever, other ones got major redesigns. I mean, seriously, some of these guys were not meant to be in a cutesy puzzle game. I think Harpy's makeover says all that needs to be said. I feel like it's also worth noting that certain entries in the Mata Motogatari series would adopt a more Puyo Puyo-centric art style later on, so these older designs don't necessarily represent the whole series. Ever since Sega took over the franchise in the 2000s, their games slowly but surely moved away from the bizarre characters of old in favor of a lot more human-like characters. That and the old characters that did make a comeback were given a makeover and they fit nicely in the new style. As much as I admire the strange and unusual, I gotta say I absolutely prefer the mostly human cast of the recent entries compared to Compile's old rogues gallery of circus freaks from the classic series. Although I will admit, it does have a lot of charm to it. Every match begins with a back and forth between Arl and the opponent, with everyone having their own unique personality. I mean seriously, check out all these funny lines I can't read. Some of them directly threaten your life while others are just vibing. One genius move by Compile is having a live face reaction from your opponent in the middle of the screen at all times. Most of the time they're neutral, but they get happy or confident when they think they're about to win, and when it's the other way around they get nervous and start to panic. Some of these expressions are fucking priceless, especially when they're defeated. Some characters become sad, others fucking die, Suke Todora looks like you stepped on him, and Draco was very offended by that racist joke you just made. If you're stuck on an opponent and it takes you several attempts, that salty expression at the end makes finally defeating them so satisfying. Speaking of which, Puyo Puyo is not an easy game. It was the arcade, so it's not too surprising that this is the case, but not only does the AI get progressively harder the further you progress, but the Poyos fall faster as well. You've gotta make sure you're at maximum focus if you want to beat this game. It eventually does relent a little by nerfing the falling speed a tiny bit if you lose, but the AI does not give the slightest fuck how many times you lose or how many quarters you waste trying to beat a walking meatloaf. This game is absolutely going to kick your ass. By the time you get to stage 9, all hell breaks loose and the falling speed is cranked up even more. This becomes a pain considering there's no counterclockwise rotation in the arcade, so with how fast they start to fall, you can't reasonably press the button fast enough to flip it to the side you want without potentially overshooting it. These final opponents do not mess around either, so you're gonna have to try again a lot. Unfortunately, this does kind of reek of first game syndrome. In every installment starting with Puyo Puyo 2, there's a counter system where you can, well, counter an opponent's chain attack. Doing one smaller can mitigate the garbage Puyos, doing one of equal size gets rid of it entirely, and doing one greater starts a chain attack of your own. There's a defense element here, and Puyo 2 basically became the competitive standard for the series to follow. Puyo 1 does not have this. 
If you get a chain attack, there's nothing the opponent can do to avoid taking it. This led people to describe Poyo 1 as 5 chain to win, as performing a 5 chain basically guarantees victory. It's not so much a battle of brains which takes offense and defense into account, but more like a fast-paced race to get the bigger chain first. Matches can end absurdly quickly because of this, and it makes the later stages even more unforgiving. Poyo 1 is still a fun game to go back to, however, and one of the biggest reasons is the fantastic soundtrack. These are some of the greatest puzzle melodies from the 16-bit era, if you ask me. Some tracks have a more classical feel, The main theme of the first eight stages is cozy and welcoming. And my favorite track has to go to Sticker, which plays in the last four stages before Satan. It's so unforgivingly jolly and it just plasters a dumb smile on my face every time. But when you get to Satan, not only is the cutscene met with this ominous and foreboding score to impose this guy as a threat, but the actual boss fight music is fucking insane! This game is a masterful showcase of the Mega Drive sound chip, as this game's cabinet was based on Mega Drive hardware, as Sega had helped develop the game. This game right here, it's pretty fun. Obviously outclassed by the sequel in pretty much every way, mind you, but it's still fun to go back to every once in a while. Compile had a smash hit on their hands, and with that success came expansion. Not only was there a fucking dump truck load of ports for the game, but Compile decided that Poyo Poyo would be coming to other countries as well. And with this initiative came a lot of bizarre iterations, all officially licensed. This was the early 90s, so English localizations of foreign media were still in their infancy, and many more liberties were taken, even more so than nowadays. Today, I'll be looking at all of the official English localizations of the first Poyo Poyo game, as well as the console ports that they're associated with, since the differences introduced carry over to their English makeovers. A couple of rules are definitely in order, so rule number one, it has to be a reskin or retooling of the first game's ROM. The game needs to be Poyo 1 at its very core, rebuilds from scratch are not being covered today. So no Timon and Pumbaa's Jungle Games. Rule number two, I'll only be looking at the ports that have their own official English version. If I were to cover every port of the first game, this video would be three hours long. I'll try to keep this in chronological order as well, basically covering each version as they were released. I know a lot of you clicked on this video for two specific ones in particular, but that will have to wait. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my grand tour, where I take a look at the many localizations and domestications of Poyo Poyo in English-speaking territories. Buckle in, because it's going to be a strange journey. Since the first version to be released was the arcade cabinet, obviously it would be the first to be translated as well. The details of this English cabinet are a total mystery. Neither Sega Today or even Compile back in the 90s had any recollection or documentation of its release. All we have is secondhand information that we don't even know is true. Allegedly it came out in 1992, the same year as the Japanese version, and it was only a test market release somewhere in Europe. Compile Club Underground, a magazine at the time, claims that it was developed in Spain, but again, there's no proof of any of this. 
We don't have release information, the team that developed it, voice actors, or even photographs or advertisements of the cabinet. All we have is ROM dumps, and if that wasn't bad enough, the very first recorded ROM of the game to hit the internet originated from illegal hardware, leading many to believe that this was a bootleg and not an official release. That's pretty mental, but it's also not surprising. Bootleg video games were everywhere during this era in both the arcades and home consoles, and some of the most infamous bootleg ROMs out there that have reached meme status come from this era of gaming. But enough of that, let's see how this translation of Poyo Poyo brings the game to a new audience. Visually, it seems mostly intact on the surface, but the longer you play, the sooner you realize how much they tampered with the game. Cutscenes were completely overhauled, so different animations play at different times or are removed altogether. This is due to the cutscenes themselves not even being translations of those from the Japanese version. They were completely rewritten, giving characters new personalities and new names. Arl was changed to Silvana, Suke Todora became Gobi Captain, Nasu Grave became Blue Ghost, Sukiapodes is Small Foot, Zo Daimo is Elephant Lord, and Draco Centaurus is now Dragon Woman. As a matter of fact, Zombie, Carbuncle, the Mummy, and the Witch were the only characters that kept their names in this version. Some of this is definitely the work of censorship. Panati was changed to Johnny because we definitely need to save the children from Greek folklore, oh no! Harpy was an angel, which was a religious reference because religion isn't a thing in real life, so she was changed to Dark Elf and had her wings cut off? And as for Satan... Do I even need to explain? He was changed to the Dark Prince, which is the only localized name from this release to stick around in every English Poyo game, even to this day. I just don't understand the motives behind most of these, though. Did they think some of these were too hard to pronounce in English? Is Silvana a more appealing name to us white folk than Arl? They literally show the names in English at the very end of the game in the Japanese version, so most of these just don't make any sense. What also makes no sense is the changes made to the cutscenes. I already mentioned this earlier, but the scenarios were completely changed for these. Everybody talks like robots with the way they word their sentences, and it's some of the most unintentionally awkward dialogue you'll ever read. If you intend to take it from me, then you have a difficult task before you. Do I even need to explain the English voice samples? Half the time our- oh, I'm sorry. Silvana's voice actress sounds bored. Fire! Ice storm! The other ones aren't much better either. Moron! Ah, here we go! I think the biggest downgrade has to go to Draco. Here's the Japanese sample. Go. And now the English dub. Go. What the fuck? Gao is a sound used in Japanese media to convey a roar of some kind by a monster or animal, usually in a cute fashion. For one, why didn't they translate this? And two, why does the voice actor scream it into the microphone with the strength of a thousand suns? Have you seen this character? She's not exactly supposed to be threatening or fearsome. I mean, just look at her in Poyo Poyo Sun. I mean, I'm just saying. The voice acting is just laughably awful. There's some kind of charm to it, but most of the time it just makes me wish I was playing the Japanese version. Sega's recent Poyo entries have fared much better with their English voice acting despite some translation quirks, so hopefully that applies to all of their other franchises too, right? Right? Hanabi-kun, I've liked you for such a long time. Will you please go out with me? Oh, mabe san Yes! It would be my honor! For years, this cabinet was long speculated to be an unlicensed release, since Compile didn't really have much information about it. However, in 2019, that all changed with the release of Sega Ages Poyo Poyo for Nintendo Switch. This was crafted by the emulation wizards at M2, and it's basically a souped-up version of the cabinet, adding counterclockwise rotation, online play, difficulty options, and the option to play using the English ROM, proving that this was indeed a real translation. That's one thing I can't help but love about Sega. They're not afraid to bring up stinky shit from their past, no matter how dated or garbage it really is. It's a cool piece of fan service, and it's great to finally have that mystery solved. We still know basically nothing about who developed it or its cast, though. In fact, Sega apparently didn't even have the ROM in their archives. They had to get this version from a collector to release it. Crazy shit. Snooping as usual! Naturally, Poyo Poyo's success in the arcade has convinced Compile to bring this new and improved take on their puzzle game to home consoles, with the first port arriving on the Mega Drive, or as it's known in America, the Genesis. 
Since the arcade cabinet was based on Mega Drive hardware, this was a mostly uncompromised port of the game. No content was cut, in fact this version adds quite a few new features. Counterclockwise rotation for the first time in the series, a single player endless mode that plays more like the MSX2 version, and difficulty options so that playing the campaign isn't a complete ball ache. This is especially a good feature to have as this is not an easy game. It's actually nice to play through the game without too much trouble sometimes, you know? The game is still challenging, but it's nerfed a bit on the easy difficulty. Not to mention it made capturing footage of these games much easier considering certain characters' AI are fucking awful in the arcade- OH YOU MOTHERFUCKER! I HOPE YOUR GRANDDAD MAKES HIS FUCKING HIP REPLACEMENT, YOU SON OF A CUN- With all these additions and the fact that visuals and music are completely unaltered, this looks like the definitive port of Puyo Puyo, right? Well, there is one major setback to this version in terms of sound. See, despite the arcade game being based on Genesis hardware, one thing it didn't have to deal with is cartridge limitations. All those voice samples in the game were possible due to cartridges not even being a factor. This port, on the other hand, was a completely different story. Genesis games often sacrificed a lot just to get voice samples in at all. The Yamaha YM2612 does not handle these very well. In fact, they're nails on a chalkboard. So with this conundrum rearing its ugly head, Compile took a different approach for the voice samples in this port. Instead of compressing the shit out of all of them, they only took three samples in the whole game and put them on the cartridge. The title screen, and two of Arl's lines mid-game. The way they optimized it is strange. In order to keep some kind of clarity, they made it to where the music completely stops when a voice sample plays. No, they don't temporarily mute the music, they pause it. So when it plays a sample, the music pauses for a second and then resumes. This can get fucking grating during the later stages when it's a constant back and forth between you and the AI. This is some excellent music and it just has its flow ruined by constant pausing to play a scratchy voice sample. Not to mention, it was satisfying to hear Arl cast all those spells in the arcade game when getting a big chain. But here, since there's only one line for that, it plays that, stops the music, and the rest of the chain just has nothing. It's extremely jarring. Luckily, there's an option in the game to turn the voice acting off entirely. No scratchy anime girls to worry about, and you can listen to the music in peace. Despite the sound problems, this is a fairly solid port of the game, and the first version to officially hit North America. Albeit with changes. A lot of changes. Allow me to introduce to you the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. This unholy monstrosity was unleashed from the bowels of Deke Entertainment. DICK! What was supposed to be a Sonic cartoon that acted as a homage to Golden Age animation, executives went in and said, no, this is fucking stupid, make it like Ren and Stimpy, the kids will like that more. So we ended up with a really shitty cartoon that had a bunch of shoehorned grouse out and some of the worst animation you'll ever see, thanks to Deke crunching the hell out of the animators they outsourced to. This cartoon was just a drop in the bucket of American companies and subsidiaries trying to localize Japanese properties for a Western audience, which mostly involved taking beloved character designs and beating them with the ugly stick. Thankfully those days are mostly over, but I could make a whole video talking about these drastic Americanizations. Back to Sonic, the only saving grace for the show was Long John Baldry as Dr. Robotnik. His performance was the only thing that makes watching the filth even remotely tolerable. Rest in peace, man. I'm going to tunnel to the main Mobius Reservoir, steal all its water, and turn that town into Lake Robotnik! <laughs> Need any help? No! Now why the fuck am I talking about this cartoon? Well, let's just say that the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog served as the inspiration for Puyo Puyo's first official journey to North America, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. Since Sega and Compile were close business partners at the time, with Sega providing Mega Drive hardware for the cabinet and having some input on the game's development, it was a no-brainer for them to team up and bring Puyo Puyo to the West with a Sonic skin. 
Sonic was far more popular in North America than it ever was in Japan, but instead of modeling this new Sonic painted Poyo Poyo after the games or the Japanese promotional art, they went with Deke's Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. The characters from Mata Motogatari were all replaced by Dr. Robotnik's henchmen robots from the first episode of the cartoon. Yes, you heard me right, just the first episode. Really makes you wonder if this was such a good idea to begin with. Three of the twelve opponents are the main three badniks from the show, Scratch, Grounder, and Coconuts. Satan is replaced with Robotnik himself. The rest are no-name motherfuckers that only have names thanks to this game. As for the main protagonist, you'd think Sonic would be the obvious replacement for Arl, right? Well no, Sonic is nowhere to be found in this game at all. No Tails either. Instead the game is pretty much played in the first person, with the robots directly talking to the player during cutscenes. Part of the charm of Poyo Poyo was seeing the back and forth between Arl and the opponent, but now it's just these bolts for brains making vague threats and bad puns and it's not exactly entertaining. This incarnation of Sonic is a snarky asshole. That would have been perfect for this game. Instead we have this. Old fuzzy face got tied in knots, huh? I guess that's why the docks sit in the boys' round. So long, sucker. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! If you've been paying attention, you might have noticed something in the game. That's Carbuncle at the bottom of the screen, just like Poyo Poyo, but he isn't a Sonic character at all. Well, in this game, Carbuncle got renamed to Has Been, which doesn't make a lick of sense whatsoever. If you're gonna recycle Carbuncle, at least have the decency to admit it instead of creating a non-existent OC for your stupid reskin. Christ. One thing this game does add that Poyo Poyo lacks is an intro cutscene explaining the plot. These aren't Poyos, they're BRAINS, WHAT THE fuck? Other than those differences, the presentation is mostly intact, with every robot having a live reaction in the center of the screen during gameplay. And my god, some of these are even better than the ones in Poyo Poyo. They're so fucking funny, and even though some of them make no sense, perhaps it's better that way. <laughs> in terms of sound, I guess Compile wasn't very happy with the results of how they implemented voiceovers in the original Genesis port, so they actually improved upon it here. There's still only a handful of clips, but instead of playing them once and muting the music, the music stays and the clip repeats at a higher pitch when getting a bigger combo. Much better. The music is another area where Mean Bean Machine shines. Poyo Poyo already had a good use of Genesis sound hardware, but this game definitely fits that Genesis sound style. The electronic industrial sound just goes so unbelievably hard. I also love Robotnik's boss theme. It's just a pounding drum solo with vague instrumentation backing it, but it's so good. But wait, let's watch that final cutscene one more time. That music sounds familiar. Is that...? Well that's a neat little retooling. But now that I think about it, the credit song sounds familiar too. That's another remixed song. Huh. What about the versus mode? Practice? 
practice mode. The password entry. The game over screen. The fucking unused music? Huh. I guess a good chunk of this game's soundtrack was recycled from Poyo Poyo. Yeah, it's kind of easy to tell that this game didn't have much of a budget. One thing I do like is how this game remixes those songs into MBM's sound font. It's got heavier percussion and a more gritty, punk-like sound that makes these songs sound a bit more... mean, no pun intended. It's not just music that's reused either. Carbuncle remains, there's only one background and it's just recycled from Poyo Poyo. And even all the fonts are the damn same. This isn't really much of a unique version of Poyo Poyo, it's a goddamn ROM hack. The enemy AI is the same across both games too. In fact, Mean Bean Machine removes content from Poyo Poyo as well. Not only are all the backgrounds axed, but the training stages that get new players used to the game are completely gone as well, and in its place is a password system, so you can pick up where you left off. For higher difficulties, I can understand having this feature, but for the average player, who the hell needs a password system in a game you can beat in 20 minutes? In the end, while Mean Bean Machine is a charming little distraction and an interesting piece of Sonic and Poyo history, it's a downgrade from Poyo 1 in basically every way. For some reason, Sega just gets their rocks off to porting this game everywhere. You think I'm joking? There's more releases of this game than there are releases of Sonic 3. Let's see, you can play Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine on... The Sega Genesis, Game Gear, Master System, PlayStation 2, GameCube, Xbox, Wii, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Nintendo 3DS, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, the Genesis Mini by M2, several low-budget plug-and-plays during the 2000s, and several PC releases as well! Not to mention, there's two different ways to play the Genesis version on the Nintendo Switch, and the Game Gear version is playable on Sonic Origins Plus! That's fucked up! This game even got a re-release on the Genesis itself! Sega just absolutely adores this game despite being branded with an outdated cartoon they don't even own the rights to! <sighs> It, it just makes no sense. The Game Gear Supersonic Sports Pack. You know who makes it. Coffee? Tea? Come! Ah! Are you sleeping, you fat no! fuck? No! I think it's time we take a detour to Sega's 90s handheld, the Game Gear. Even though it was basically just a portable master system and it was somehow worse than the Game Boy, it too had its own port of Poyo Poyo. If you want a Game Gear version of Poyo Poyo, this is certainly gonna get the job done. This is essentially a one-to-one -one port of the arcade game with a huge visual downgrade due to the hardware, as well as a quest mode which is basically the single player content from the MSX and Famicom version. Cool addition! The endless mode from the console version is intact as well. The big drawback comes from the overall presentation though. Some visuals are carried over mostly flawlessly from the arcade, seriously this is impressive stuff for an 8-bit handheld. However, all of the cutscenes have been removed entirely. Like I said before, the cutscenes are what gave the game a lot of its character. Without them, it doesn't really feel all that engaging outside of the actual gameplay. Combine that with the portraits having practically no animation, and this is definitely the most lifeless and boring version of the game thus far. The music certainly doesn't help either. There's really not that much to say here. Wanna play Poyo Poyo on the shitter? Here you go. Now why am I even bringing this up? Well, this version was released in English too, and it's called... Mean Bean Machine. Yeah, this version was robotniced up for Western audiences just like the Genesis version. There's not really that much to say about this one. It does demake the intro cutscene from the Genesis version, and the quest mode is intact, but I don't care about this one whatsoever. However, there is another English release of this game on the Game Gear that isn't Mean Bean Machine. Strangely enough, Compile did make an English translation for this game, but instead of doing what a normal company would do and release that version in America, they decided to put this translation on the Japanese cartridge for the game, and it would activate if the game detected that it was being played on an American Game Gear. This version would be known as... Puzzle Kids! Huh? Why does this exist? Who thought that it needed to be renamed to Puzzle Kids? And why is this translation on the Japanese cartridge? There's no funny localized names for me to mock because it doesn't show them in this version of the game, and this cartridge is one of three Japanese exclusive Game Gear titles to change languages based on what region you're from. The other two are a game called Buster Fight and some fucking McDonald's game! It's absolutely time to move on now, this is fucking retarded. Welcome to 
Nightmare Enterprises, King DDD. How can I assist you? Look, pal, I don't like to complain, but I paid you folks a lot of money for an octopus monster, and it turned out to be a little shrimp. Despite Sega helping out a lot with the arcade game's development, and later owning the IP entirely when Compile went bankrupt, Compile in the 90s was the sole owner of Puyo Puyo, so they could port the game to whatever console they wanted, including those from Sega's main competitor, Nintendo. Super Puyo Puyo for the Super Famicom, or Super Nintendo, is actually the most interesting port thus far, as it's the only one I'll be looking at today that isn't on Sega hardware. Visually, everything seems mostly intact on the surface, barring a few presentational differences like the cutscene fading into gameplay instead of sliding. Holy shit, massive difference! Ooh, nobody gives a shit! But when you actually start playing, there's one glaring change. What the fuck happened here? Why is the face cam over on the opponent's side? Well, there's actually a technical explanation for this, so prepare for Professor Joseph Toastyman III to bore you to death with a lecture about gaming consoles from the 90s. You see, while the Genesis displayed games at a resolution of 320 by 224 the Super Nintendo, on the other hand, runs games at 256 by 224 instead meaning a shorter horizontal resolution and a squashed aspect ratio. As a result, a lot of multi-platform games on both the Genesis and the Super Nintendo had to take this lower resolution into account. This meant that for most games, the Super Nintendo port had to be cropped. Super Puyo Puyo was no exception here. In fact, you can see the cropping in action if you pay close attention to the cutscenes, as they're zoomed in as well. If Compile wanted to keep the presentation in-game completely intact, they would either have to reanimate the portraits or the Poyos themselves completely from scratch, and I don't think that was really in their budget for a simple port. So fuck it, move the picture over to the right. They actually decided to include an option to adjust the portrait's position. It's not an ideal solution, but they made do with what they had, so I can't really fault them too much for that. Other than the cropping, it's a seamless transition to the SNES visually. The color palette saw a nice upgrade as well. What isn't so seamless, however, is the sound. The SNES and Genesis are very different beasts in terms of audio. Thanks to the SNES having larger cartridge space and cleaner sound hardware, voice lines are back with no cuts, and they actually sound clearer than they do in the arcade. <laughs> That's actually an impressive feat considering the cabinet didn't even need to take cartridges into consideration. Now the downside here comes in the form of the music. Despite the Genesis having technically inferior hardware, it has a distinct sound that really can't be replicated on the Super Nintendo. As a result, while some games sound better on the SNES, Others just sound better on the Genesis. Super Puyo Puyo is an interesting case, as this soundtrack is a mixed bag of smooth transitions and diarrhea. Some songs actually sound really good. The main theme is alright, but it sounds a little weird with the new instruments. But the rest of the soundtrack is plagued by strange instrument choices. Just what the hell is this? These feel like fan remixes on YouTube, but no, they're actually in the game. They just feel so... wrong. You can tell these were not meant to be played on a Super Nintendo initially. And as for the final boss theme, you can tell it's really trying. It's trying so hard to sound like the Genesis version, but it just can't quite get it. Considering Super Puyo Puyo's setbacks as well as advantages, I'd say this is about on par with the Genesis port and it's really up to preference as to which version you prefer. For me though, 
I'd say the music on the Genesis just completely wipes the floor with the SNES. And since Sega apparently made a lot of money on Mean Bean Machine, Nintendo seemingly wanted a piece of that pie, so they parted with Compile to make their own localized version of Poyo Poyo with their own character. Kirby. Who doesn't like Kirby? If you don't like Kirby, that's punishable by death in most US states. Immediately with the idea, I can say that Kirby is a far more fitting series to reskin Poyo Poyo with than the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. Kirby has a similar cutesy aesthetic to the Poyo series, and there's plenty of different characters and enemies to pick from. So let's see how Compile implemented Kirby's DNA into the last game we'll be looking at today, Kirby's Avalanche, or Kirby's Ghost Trap in Europe. Yeah, Kirby had a lot of renames over in Europe, I don't know why. Kirby's Avalanche. Going into the menu, well would you look at that, they didn't cut the training stages like Mean Bean Machine did. Visually this game is nowhere near as derivative as Mean Bean Machine and actually goes out of its way to replace most of the Poyo assets with original ones based on the Kirby series. They even replaced the old arcade tutorial with a new one featuring a SNES controller, they didn't have to do that. In fact, other than the Poyos themselves and the options menu, all that's recycled from Super Poyo Poyo is the game over screen, featuring Kirby of course, and one single music track. Everything else in this game is completely original. Carbuncle is gone, replaced by Kirby dancing in this little box. All of the backgrounds are new. The one frame they recycle from Poyo Poyo has a new background as well. And the soundtrack remixes a lot of music from various Kirby games. One thing I didn't expect was for them to keep the cutscenes the same, but they did. Kirby has a back and forth conversation with the opponent just like Poyo Poyo, and he's a bit of an asshole here to some of the characters. It's really out of brand for Kirby to be speaking in complete English sentences since nowadays he does nothing but blabber like a Neanderthal, but it does still feel like Kirby in certain parts. Like not directly being an asshole to Dedede as he's more of a rival than a villain, or only refusing a duel with Meta Knight because he doesn't have a sword. This game also has a lot of voice acting just like Super Poyo Poyo, but the direction they took is a little strange. They just have one guy and one girl saying the names of the characters on the versus screen. Some of these are pretty funny. Kabu, Evan Mole, Meta Knight, Rondo Burt, King Day Day Day. And as for the Poyo stuff, this game is generally much more respectful than Mean Bean Machine in that regard. They actually leave the Poyos unchanged outside of gameplay as opposed to MBM, which turns them into these fucking things. Why does that one have a mustache? In fact, the arena where the final stretch of the game takes place is branded with a red Poyo on the floor, and there's a gray one on the trophy Kirby gets in the ending. And take a look at that title screen. They're not even trying to hide it. It's a very faithful reskin that actually feels like its own thing for a new audience. Even though it's still Super Poyo Poyo at its very core, it shakes things up enough to justify existing while only recycling things that make sense. It has that Nintendo attention to detail, and after looking at the credits, it's no wonder why it's so good, considering Kensuke Tanabe was credited. This guy was involved with a lot of Nintendo-related projects being developed by outside studios like Compile. He worked with Rareware on Donkey Kong Country, Square Enix on Super Mario RPG, Retro Studios on Metroid Prime and the Donkey Kong Country Returns series, as well as Next Level Games on Punch-Out Wii and the Luigi's Mansion sequels. Nintendo hasn't forgotten about this game either. It's been re-released on the Wii and Wii U Virtual Consoles, as well as being available on the Nintendo Switch through their online scam, alongside Super Poyo Poyo 2, oddly enough. I'm not complaining though, that's a good-ass game. Strangely enough, this game was never released in Japan in any form, but Mean Bean Machine was, and that stupid-ass cartoon didn't even air over there! Well, that concludes today's list of releases of the first Poyo game in English-speaking territories. A bizarre but influential chapter in the Poyo series' history. A relic of a time when companies thought Americans hated Japanese art until Pokemon took over the world a few years later, so that was a pretty bad judgment call, don't you think? 
the Poyo series has had a really tough time breaking into the Western market for ages. In the beginning, it just couldn't do it without major changes. I guess Compile was scarred for life over the failure of the English cabinet that only had a failed test run in a lonely and rural part of Europe. And the English versions of the first game that actually got made were either stuck on a Japanese cartridge not many people could import back then, or became lost media for ages with some really bad translation work done. Future games in the series skipped North America entirely until Poyo Poyo Fever, as well as some Game Boy game, but who gives a fuck? And that was when Sega took control of the series and made a pseudo-serious attempt at localizing it, with varying results I might add. They brought over a few games under the new localized title Poyo Pop and stopped entirely after a while, preferring to re-release Mean Bean Machine again a hundred fucking times. Future games starting in the mid-2000s would stay Japan exclusive until Poyo Poyo Tetris finally got an international release after massive fan demand, but that took three whole years to happen. Nowadays, things are looking up for the series over here since Poyo Poyo Champions and Poyo Poyo Tetris 2 instantly got English releases. Considering how Sega refuses to publish any new entries for their IPs other than Like a Dragon and Sonic the Hedgehog, that's pretty surprising. Sega officially values the puzzle game over Streets of Rage, Shenmue, and Alex Kidd. I scripted and recorded that before the Game Awards happened, and wouldn't you know it, Sega just fucking shadow announces like five new fucking games for abandoned franchises, including Streets of Rage. By the way, Sega, can we please get another racing game from Sumo Digital featuring all of your IPs? Like, come on. That shit would be awesome. The reskinned domestications from Sega and Nintendo have made a huge impact on the series and the public's perception of it. So many people like myself got introduced through Mean Bean Machine. True story, I was playing my Switch one time at school during study hall years ago, and someone noticed that I was playing Super Poyo Poyo 2. His first reaction was, hey, that looks like Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. We then had a conversation about the whole thing, and he said he first played Mean Bean Machine on one of those old budget plug-and-plays from the 2000s. It's pretty wild how much reach that version still has to this day. If you have a PS5, you could either play Poyo Poyo Tetris 2, or Mean Bean Machine. It's unreal that both modern Poyo and an outdated domestication can coexist. As for my personal opinion, I can't help but have a slight distaste for these two games. It's basically Western companies treating the original game like garbage, and a statement that basically says, you're not good enough for the Western market. Replace that anime girl with Robotnik's fat ass, that'll sell copies. It's also insulting to American consumers, like they're too stupid to understand a puzzle game, so it needs to be sanitized and warped with something they recognize so they can be nice and cozy and don't have to try something new. It's a byproduct of Western companies pissing all over Japanese art with their own stupid take on it through promotional material or whatever. You don't see the Japanese do- I stand corrected. Thankfully, these days are mostly over, but the lingering xenophobia still drifts through the air with foreign imports, such as English translations shoving in biased politics and social commentary, or references to current events. This is something that needs to stop, because nobody is going to turn on anime or play a Japanese video game to be lectured about the fucking patriarchy, what's wrong with you? But on the other hand, I cannot deny the impact that Mean Bean Machine and Kirby's Avalanche had. The former is far more well known, but Kirby's Avalanche has its fans, and I can consider it a great version of Poyo 1 because of how it respects the source material while putting a Kirby spin on it. Mean Bean Machine is a glorified ROM hack in comparison. These were basically a lot of people's gateway into discovering one of the greatest puzzle series in all of gaming, and its influence has basically come full circle. Poyo Poyo Tetris 2 features Sonic as a playable character. All we need is the next entry to have Dr. Eggman and we'll basically achieve world peace. In Sonic Mania, the boss fight in Chemical Plant Act 2 is a match of Poyo Poyo against Dr. Eggman. I already mentioned this in the previous video, but what I didn't bring up is the music. Sound familiar? In the end, this series had a strange journey to the West, and while it seems shitty in hindsight, it definitely helped the series in the long run.